Good morning, everyone. We've got Erica online. I hear her. So glad you're here this morning. Uh, we're checking one thing. Um, make sure that you can hear me on this microphone. I've got the new lapel mic plugged in. Um, tell me if you can hear me. Say something to Patricia or maybe she can turn it up and let me know. It is one minute till. We'll be starting in just a few seconds. And Bert is fired up and ready to go. I'm ready. I'm going to turn on my sound just for a minute to make sure I can hear you. All right, Patricia, can you hear me? Ah, excellent. All right, turn it back down, please, and we're mm -hmm. starting. Okay. All right, take a look here. I've got my trusty laser printer. Jesus was 12 years old. It was about 5 AD. Remember, we've established that he was born around 8 BC. So to be 12, it would have to be about 5 AD. He's traveled a long way with his mom and dad to the temple in Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And when the feast was over, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. That's our story. This is the painting I always remember from my Sunday school literature. Patricia, have you seen that before? Does that look familiar to you? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think everybody's seen that who went to Sunday school. Um, it's a painting um, by, that's hanging in a museum in Dresden, Germany, in Deutschland. Mm -hmm. And um, it's called Jesus in the Temple by Heinrich Hoffmann. He painted it in 1881. And uh, we could go on about that, but I just wanted to give you sort of a picture of how a German artist might have seen him in the late 19th century, and boy does he and everyone else there look European. Mm -hmm. Now this is the only story of Jesus' childhood in, uh, in the Nazareth growing up years that's in your Bible. The Gospels of Matthew and Mark, if you, you can read along if you like, the Ga Gospels of Matthew and Mark and John include zero stories from Jesus' childhood and growing up years in Nazareth. Luke is the only writer to include such a story. And it's the story of Jesus disappearing for three days and then and uh, when he was 12 years old and scaring, literally scaring his dad and mom terribly, half to death as we say in the South, right? So I'm wondering... If you had all of these stories from Jesus' childhood, why do you pick this one? Uh, it's uh, traumatic. Jesus and his parents don't agree. The disagreement is not resolved. Lots of questions. The first time I preached this, I was, all, I was probably, I don't know, I may have been about 28 years old. And um, I was greeting people at the back of the church as they left after the worship service. And I'll never forget it. And this is a quote. An elderly woman in the congregation leaned forward to me and said, I don't believe I'd have preached that. And what she meant was either I preached it badly or maybe this story just got to her. It gets to me. Um, and I can't wait to share more with you about it. So, Maybe if you think that the words of Jesus, the very first words that he speaks in a gospel are important, and I think they are to Matthew, Mark, and John, if you'll look right here, Matthew's first line has to do with talking John the Baptist into baptizing him so that together they can fulfill all righteousness. Oh, Matthew and righteousness, right? And then Mark. Jesus' first words in Mark or that famous sermon that he and John preached, that the kingdom of God is near. Believe the good news. And in John's gospel, the question gospel in some ways, if you will, just look at all the questions sometime in chapter 7 of John's gospel. It's insane. John 1, the first thing Jesus says in John's gospel is, what are you looking for? Perfect 
question for John's Gospel, knowing the theology just a little bit. Who is this guy? What is he saying? That's the power of John, but what about Luke? Well, if you wanted to be unfair and exaggerate a little bit, you'd say that Luke picked a real stinker because the first thing that Jesus says in John's Gospel is when Jesus is 12 years old and his parents have been frantically searching for him for over three days in Jerusalem, a crowded city full of pilgrims. And when his mom gave him a bit of a tongue lashing, he was astonished and he said, why were you looking for me? Now, what do you do with that? Well, you know, either you hate it or you love it. But we're going to go with what the scriptures say, because here's the deal. You know, there, uh, there are people who think that the Gospels really glorified Jesus' divinity, and it was those Gnostic Gospels a few centuries later that emphasized Jesus' humanity. The opposite is true no matter what author Dan Brown says. Da Vinci Code, that fact page at the beginning of his novel, absolutely false. Completely untrustworthy statements that he makes in that fact page at the beginning of the novel. Um, because, as you can see here, and elsewhere through all four of the Gospels, it emphasizes Jesus' humanity. Look at this conversation he's having with his mom. Look at him not being where he's supposed to be. Look at them being frantic and worried. Look at him being astonished and not understanding why they're worried. He's 12. Jesus' humanity is showing here. Um, there's more than that showing, as we'll see. But there's humanity showing here, and it's the Gnostic Gospels who emphasize to a great degree Jesus' divinity and diminish his humanity uh, with a kind of a dualism between spirit and body. Even humanness, flesh, is, is considered evil by the Gnostics. They, they don't like anything that's human. It's the, it's the divine spark, the spirit, that is good, essentially good. And therefore, the divinity is good and humanity is bad. But that's, that's the Gnostics. Dan Brown has it exactly backwards. It's the Gospels in our Bible that emphasizes humanity. If you don't believe me, watch this story. Now, you might not be able to see it. I'm going to try to show it to you. This is modern Nazareth right here. And right there is a big white basilica, the Basilica of the Annunciation. That big white building right there is a giant Catholic church. And it has a black dome on the top, if you can see, right there behind the cursor. And now you can see it, black dome. And it, and it, and it looks like it's in a valley, and in a way it is, but it's more like, think of being, it being in a bowl on the top of a mountain sort of like a, a, a long, low volcano. It's got kind of a dip in the top of the mountain where you can put a little secluded village right in that little bowl. And this is a, an artist's rendering of the first century uh, village of Nazareth, which may have had about 300 people in it, at the most five, and at the time of Jesus. And you can see that this church is built over one of these houses, and one of those houses is venerated, we know from the archaeological excavation, venerated to a very early date as being a place significant in the life of Jesus, maybe their home. Now, they're going to be going from Nazareth all the way to Jerusalem, and they don't have a plane or a train or a bus or a car or a motorcycle or a bicycle. They do have animals. Um, some people can afford them. But people pilgrimage not just from all over Israel, but from all over the Mediterranean basin where, uh, where people born Hebrew and then uh, people who converted to the, is, um, to the Israelite faith would come pouring in for the Passover you can see the throng of people coming in here from the southwest, coming up toward the temple, which is right there. Luke 2.41 says, Now Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem every year for the feast of the Passover. Now this custom of Jesus' family, of going every year to the feast of the Passover, 
shows their piety in obeying the law because it does indeed require it. Exodus 23:14 says three times in a year you must make a pilgrimage feast to me. Now that that's a that's that's a long way to go on foot three times or more a year. The scriptures do say Matthew's gospel says that that Joseph was a righteous man. He he followed the Old Testament rules. He was a man who played it by the book. So, how come they didn't just go 60 miles straight south like that? You see it? Why didn't they just go from here to here straight down? Well, guess what's right in the middle there that the Israelites in Galilee would avoid when going to the temple in Jerusalem? It's Samaria. Samaria would defile them. They don't like the Samaritans. Uh, they, the Samaritans don't like them. It's dangerous. They're scared. They're uninterested. And the law says they don't mix. So where are they going to go? They're either going to go down and over to on the Via Morris to the coast and then cut up to Jerusalem this way. That's perfectly legit. Jesus and his family could have done that. Just go down to the coast of the Mediterranean and go up to the mountains to Jerusalem. Okay, but they also, and, and there's a lot of documentation that suggests this is probably more likely, they would go a little bit south down to the Beit Shan Valley, and they would cut across, and either on this side of the Jordan, or maybe even the other side of the Jordan, go all the way down here, cross the Jordan River at the Dead Sea, and then go up to Jerusalem. Now, when it says they went up to Jerusalem, they really went up. Nazareth about a thousand feet below above sea level. But once you get off that little mountain and down into the Beit Shan Valley, you're 500 feet below sea level. And then you go down even farther. By the time you get to Jericho, you're a thousand feet below sea level. And guess what? Jerusalem's over 2000 feet above sea level. So in 15 miles, you're going to go over 3000 miles in elevation up. It is up. You have to be in good health to pull something like this off. Obviously, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus did fine, so far as we know, and they were traveling for safety with an entourage from Nazareth, probably a hundred people or more. Many in the village would go to each of these festivals. So now you can see that they can't go the direct road, can't go the direct route. Remember, Jesus later would go through Samaria all the time and embrace them. But not this is this is back when he's a kid. This is when Joseph's in charge and they're playing it by the book. And uh, so he, he's probably taking option two, which is to travel the Jordan River Valley as seen on the map right here with the gold arrows. So that's, how far is that? Well, I mean, again, let me give you an estimate. It, you know, instead of being 60 miles straight, and by the way, that wouldn't be straight because these are mountains. So you'd be winding. It'd be more than 60 miles. But with all the winding and turning and going across the river over here, it might take it up to 90 miles. 90 miles. How many days does that take several so they probably go down to Jericho for 15 miles spend the night on the way home and then go part of the way back up here spend the night here maybe three or four nights to get back home that's a long long way it was considered by the Roman soldiers 20 miles was considered a day's walk a day's march and that's soldiers so could they have made 20 miles a day three or four days in a row maybe but it may have been more like a week's trip you know, they have to carry all their stuff with them. They've got children. Oh, my. Yeah. So when they get, if they're coming up from Jericho, they'll be coming up from over here on that side, on the east. So they come up to the Mount of Olives, which is about, oh, I think it's 26 and a half, 100, 20, 26, uh, about a little, 2650 maybe, um, in elevation. And then they go back down, and maybe they went in the Golden Gate right here to the temple, or they may have come around and gone into the more formal southern gates down here and gone in from the south. There were numerous gates they could have gone in. If they came in from the Mediterranean, they would have walked right past this spot, which is where Jesus was crucified. So imagine 12-year-old Jesus walking past the spot where he would later die, going in the gate here, and then making his way up into the temple. This is the city of Jerusalem in red from that time period approximately. This is an older map. Some things have changed. Archaeology's 
come a long way. And the black the line that you see is the new modern, well, I say modern, 500-year-old year old walls that make up the modern old city of Jerusalem. So they had a long way to go, but they were going to a place that was unimaginably beautiful. Look at it. Look, there's someone, an, art, an artist took great care to follow all the archaeological instructions on how this temple looked. There are detailed descriptions. And then we have Machpelah down in Hebron, which Herod the Great built exactly in the same style as this temple. And you see that this is the temple in here. And this is the big Temple Mount complex with all of the stoa or colonnaded porticos all around it. The one up over here on the east, Solomon's portico. This is the upper city. This is the lower city. And this is the Mount of Olives over here. Let's zoom in a little bit more and look at it from the time of Jesus from a helicopter's point of view. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. Yes, they did go up very much so luke 2 42 again the temple is here the priests and the altar out here the court of the women out here the court of the gentiles out here the royal stoa here solomon's porticos here the golden gate this is the beautiful gate you get the picture uh, antonio fortress golgotha back here the site of jesus's death this is where jesus at 12 years old is being taken by his parents and remember they're going four times a year his entire um, life from the time he's four until the time he starts his ministry at about the age of 30 he's going multiple times every year he knows this place he knows people here uh, this it's, it's not like he's lost in Jerusalem it's, he's never been there before he's been there frequently notice that the temple right here is in about the same spot as the Golden Dome there's a rock under there, a sacra, the rock. It's on the, uh, the dome of the rock is called Al-Haram al-Sharif by the Arabs. This is a mosque. This is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And usually they refer to this entire, what the Jews called Temple Mount, right here, this rectangle. They refer to the whole thing as um, Al-Aqsa, Al-Aqsa. And again, you can see the, the city of Jerusalem, and right there is Golgotha. And that's not far. I mean, think about it. Oh, and this is the Western Wall down here where the holiest site in Judaism. Now let's look a little closer. Out here is the court of the Gentiles. Then we have the porticos all around. Solomon's porches are right here. This is the Golden Gate. That's the beautiful gate. These are the, the royal stoa over here. And I'm thinking that Jesus is sitting with the scholars in here. Just keep that in mind that this may be where Jesus is sitting with the scholars learning and teaching because the offices of the scribes and the Pharisees were said to have been here. This is where a lot of teaching went on. The money changers uh, had their tables here. This is where commerce took place. Um, this was the hub of uh, the leadership of the temple. So probably Jesus was 12 years old sitting around in here with the scholars. So we're going to look at what that looks like on the inside of there. But just get the grandeur of this place if you can. This is real gold on these doors. Okay, This is real marble here on the facade. Um, this polished limestone is bright white in the sun. And uh, again, the beautiful gate, court of the women, the priests in here. And if you look inside the building, you can again see the courtyard of the women, the priests. There's the altar right there. On the inside of the building, we have the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant once stood. Then you have this outer area where you have the veil, the altar of incense, the table of showbread, the lampstand, the porch, all kinds of stuff in there representing uh, Hebrew worship. Over here, you can see these are people. Those little ant-like things right there, those are people. Get, just get the, the size of the place. Here's another cutaway that you can look at to imagine, and another cutaway here to look at. And I want to show you this. This is how serious they were. On all of these doors was a sign, apparently. We found, I think we found two, maybe two and a half of them. 
This, this sign right here used to be on one of these doors, maybe even the beautiful door. It's written in Greek so that foreigners can read it because Greek, Koine Greek, was the lingua franca of the Roman Empire at that particular time. If you wanted to do business, if you wanted to travel, it's like English is today. It's the most common language of commerce because it is. It's just designated. Well, Greek was designated. This sign actually reads, no foreigner may enter within these within the balustrade around the sanctuary he means this wall these doors on the outside of the sanctuary um, and the enclosure whomever is caught on himself shall he put blame for the death which will ensue you go you're a foreigner you go in these doors you get caught you're dead duck So I think maybe here in the royal stoa might have been where Jesus was sitting with the teachers. It's on the western side of the Temple Mount. Um, excuse me, the southern side of the Temple Mount. And it had these three porches, three, three aisles on the inside. And of course, Josephus, one of the most famous historians from that day, wrote that uh, this particular edifice, this three-aisled colonnade, he said was to be mentioned better than any other under the sun. And he was in Rome when he wrote that. So he knew this to be one of the most magnificent structures. If you were inside of it, you could look out of it like this. See the people down here? You could look out on the magnificent temple. But look at the inside of this thing. It's just really inspiring. You can gaze on the temple. You can sit around on the steps and columns down here and, and teach and learn and listen Worship if you like. Pray if you like. And on the inside, it's a forest of these magnificent, huge columns. Maybe Jesus was down here somewhere, sitting around like this. Okay? Luke 2, 43. But when the feast was over, as they were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. I love it that uh, Luke made a special extra sentence right here. His parents did not know it. Problem, right? You ever got lost as a child? Have you ever lost a child? We lost Will one time on vacation. We were at the beach and we looked up and he was gone. Guess where we found him? Where? At my mom and dad's condo. <laughs> he just walked away. Well, Jesus just walked away. But Will had an excuse. He was four. This guy's 12. Mm -hmm. He's been there for three days. But when the feast was over, when the feast was over and they were returning home, he stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't know it. Well, what's going to happen? Well, the first thing I want you to notice is, is that you know, they went about a day's journey, I presume. They've been walking for some time. They're headed all the way back to, uh, to Nazareth, and it's the first leg of their journey. And I want you to notice that they weren't worried that they didn't see him for a while. That says something about how much they trusted him. He, he, he apparently was responsible, and they had great confidence and his ability not to do dumb stuff. And he had other friends uh, there, uh, maybe even younger brothers or sisters, because by the time Jesus is 12, certainly he has maybe some younger brothers and sisters that I would have traveled to, although it doesn't say. But at the age of 12, here he is, and he, he's hanging behind, and, and the parents, because they trust him so much, have gone I don't know, a few miles down toward Jericho or maybe a few miles down toward the Mediterranean Sea on their way back north, going home to Nazareth. And it, at some point, um, the boys come running by and probably Mary said something like, I'm not seeing Jesus. And Joseph says, he's around, he's around, he's around, no worries. And they went a little farther. And then maybe Joseph said, Mary, I'm not seeing Jesus. And then maybe it's getting toward dark and they're making a camp and they're searching and they're asking everybody, have you seen Jesus? They're asking all his little friends, 
When was the last time you saw Jesus? I don't know. Uh, and they're asking everybody and they're going around through every single person. He is not there. Well, at that point, what do you do as a parent? Well, you panic. But at the same time, you know you've got to keep your head straight because you've got to think about where would he be? What could have happened? And barring him having been, you know, thrown in a ditch somewhere, um, kidnapped, fallen off of a cliff or some other injury, bit by a snake, maybe he just got lost in the city. I mean, that makes more sense, right? Mm -hmm. He's just lost in the city and they don't have cell phones. So what's he going to do? Where's he going to go? There's no lost and found place for little boys. I mean, so they, they're going to go and see if they can ask or find out where he is. Obviously, Jesus is a smart kid. He's going to be in an obvious place. We're going to find him, right? So they're frantic. They go all the way back to Jerusalem. Luke 2.46. This just gets juicier every verse. (laughs) After three days. Now remember, they traveled a day, or at least a good part of a day, before they realized he was missing. So they've got to turn around and go back whatever they backtracked, plus three days. So it may have been four total. It's been a while. I, I never didn't know where my kid was for more than, you know, a, a few minutes. Four minutes, five minutes, not four or five days, you know. So after three days, they found him. It took them a long time to wander around Jerusalem trying to find this boy. They found him in the temple courts. Maybe that colonnade where I was showing you. You know, maybe maybe up in here. See this? Up in here somewhere. Maybe in these columns. Maybe on the steps. Okay? Sitting among the teachers. Listening to them. And asking them questions. What did, what did I say earlier about a human Jesus? Because if you wanted to make Jesus, if the gospel writers wanted to make Jesus all spooky divine, well, he'd have been born, you know, speaking every language on earth. He wouldn't have needed to learn how to get, you know, break the diaper habit, get potty trained. He wouldn't have needed to learn the Bible. He had already had it memorized. Uh, you know, and in this situation, he wouldn't have had to ask any questions. Sure. He's asking questions. Mm-hmm. He is asking questions. That's what Luke says. So are we to presume that Jesus had a lot to learn growing up just like any other child? <gasps> <laughs> blasphemy! It's blasphemy! He had to learn? No! Look. He may, if, he, if you're like me, you believe Jesus was 100% God in the flesh. But you might have a little trouble doing this too. How about 100% human? I know. He had to learn. All right? And so he's, he's obviously where he wants to be. He's so focused on this, he doesn't see anything else. He wants to talk. He wants to listen. He wants to ask questions. He wants to answer questions. And he's sitting there doing it for days and they're all kind of huddled up with him. Right? Now check this out. I want you to learn these two words. Existe me. Existe me. And the second word down here, that's right here. The second word is ekpleso. Ekpleso. They both mean amazed or astonished, but a different kind of amazed and astonished. Okay, so Luke writes in 247 and all who heard him were amazed exist me um, at his understanding and his answers. And this word literally means thrown for a loop, knocked for a flip, blown away. They were just marveling and stunned. At his brilliance, okay? That's a good thing. So he's, he's over here and he's doing his thing and they're just blown away. Knocked off their feet. Amazed. Thrown for a loop. Then the next sentence is Luke 2, 8. When his parents saw him, here they are freaking out. When his parents saw him, 
They were astonished. So, okay, that's ek pleso. Mary and Joseph were also amazed, astonished. But this word means slapped in the face. They, they were disrespected. They felt disrespected. They felt they were hurt, terrified, furious, scared, every emotion you can have when you can't find your boy. And here he is sitting there not worried about a thing in the world, having a good old time, talking and chatting, just sitting there talking and chatting. What must they be thinking? Well, Luke tells us what they were, how they felt. They felt slapped in the face. That's what that word literally means, ek pleso. All right? So, amazed and astonished in a good way, amazed and astonished in a bad way by people in the same spot, in the same temple, all right? Dealing with the same kid. Amazing, right? Okay, so let's see what happens. <gasps> guess who Guess who gives poor little Jesus a tongue lashing? It ain't Joseph. Mary is hot, man. She's, 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 a, she's a volcano. The first word out of her mouth in front of God and the teachers and everybody in the middle of the temple was the word technon in Greek. She wouldn't have spoken it in Greek. But she said, child. I want you to hear that. Some people might have heard their dad or their mom say, boy. Or, son, young man, you hearing me? She ain't playing. No. That was not high. Hello, how are you doing? We, we were a little worried. We were just a little worried. You okay? You want to go home now? <laughs> Come on. That's, that's parenting in the 21st century, right? Uh -huh. You ask your children permission, you know? Uh -huh. It's like, do you want to go to bed? Yes, you do. Come on. <laughs> Mary don't play like that. Uh -uh. No. My Child. Mm -hmm. Now this is literally what, the literal translation never sounds great. It sounds kind of weird because of word order and such. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to do it exactly in the Greek, so I did. Why do to us you this way? Meaning, why do you do this to us? Why do you treat us like this? Notice it's present tense. It's not, why did you do this? Why were you doing this? It's, why are you doing this now? Why, why, did, why do you do this to us? You follow? Everybody thinks about Mary as being kind of a, a saint, you know, and that... God forbid she should ever get angry or raise her voice. Holy cow. Child. Why do you treat us this way? And then she says, look, which is my, I guess if we were taking it into Marlin, modern parlance would be something like, would you look at us? Wake up. Open your eyes. Do you see our faces with your own eyes? Look at our faces. Do we look like we're happy? Do you understand what's going on here? Wake up. Look. Look at the situation. Think. Think. The father of you and I in agony were searching for you. Or to put it like this, your father and I have frantically been looking for you. Frantic. In agony. Literally the word is agony. Okay. So this, this is the confrontation. He's sitting there. He's fine. They're standing there. They're not fine. Okay? Check it out. Here is 12-year-old Jesus' response in Luke 2.49. And it's an idiom. It's almost impossible to translate. When, when I say an idiom, it's like, you know, we say stuff in, in English that if you take it literally, it doesn't make any sense. But if I said, if I, if I met you on the street and I said, hey, what's up? You don't do this. The sky. 
When you say what's up, that means how are you? Mm -hmm. But someone from another culture wouldn't know that. There's something going on right here. He said to her, and, he, and there's some words missing that you almost have to imply. Why is it that you were seeking me? Know not you or not know you that in the things of the Father of me must be I? That's literal, okay? If you want to attempt a, a, a little smoother translation, maybe right here at the bottom. Did you not know that in the things of my Father it behooves me to be? So he's saying, why were you looking for me? Why didn't you know that I'd be right here? Where else would I be, Mom? Yep. You know me. Mm -hmm. Where's my heart? You know I can't wait to get here. You know I hate to leave. You know, mm -hmm. how come it took you three days to, to come here? Where else would I be, Mom? Yep. She's saying, son, think. He's saying, Mom, oops. He's saying, Mom, think. Wow. I love this little kid. It's from a movie, I think. He's like, hey, well, look at the expression. It's like, what'd I do? So let this sink in. Luke tells us in one very short verse, Luke 2.50, yet his parents did not understand what he said to them. So, what do we have here? We have a bit of a stalemate, don't we? Like to use the words from chess, or maybe if you were watching a Western, what do they call it, a Mexican standoff, where everybody's standing there with their guns aimed at one another at the same time? Mm -hmm. it, this is a bit of a standoff. We have Jesus over here. We have Mary and Joseph over here. Okay? And the outline for this scene in the temple is, is that Jesus stuns the teachers, Jesus stuns his parents. Mm -hmm. The parents stun Jesus. Why? What? And then Jesus stuns them right back. Everyone's standing there stunned. The end? This is the end? Essentially, yes. This is the end. You know, and Luke has a hard job because, you know, he's got to get us from this story to Jesus being about 30 years old. No other stories. He ain't got any more. He hadn't got any stories of him when he was 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Nothing. He's got nada. All right? So what Luke does in these situations to try to bridge the gap is he creates little transitional verses. And that's what we have here. We've got to get 12, we've got to get this story of this Mexican standoff stalemate right here between Jesus and his parents. We've got to get that back to Nazareth, and then we've got to get the story all the way up until you know Jesus is 30. So this is how he does it. Here they are returning home. Everything's fine. Nobody died. Everybody's a little traumatized. But Luke says this. In two verses, then he, Jesus, went down, and it is down, with them, and came to Nazareth, and was obedient to them. Not that he wasn't before, but he might be a little more extra careful now. Mm -hmm. You don't want to break your mama's heart by accident. Yep. So he may have been a little worried about her. Mm -hmm. So... He was obedient to them, but his mother, it's interesting the word but, but, see, Jesus went home with him and was obedient, but his mother kept, sometimes it's translated treasured, kept all these things. Sometimes it's translated words, words of Jesus. She kept all these things in her heart. What, what that says to me is that Jesus' response to the way that this story went down was that he maintained his obedience to them with more care. Because the next sentence says that Jesus increased in wisdom. That means he had less before as a child. Now he has more 
as an adult. He's increasing in wisdom and in stature and in divine and human favor. So he's, he's pleasing God. He's pleasing those who love him and those whom he loves. Growing up, learning, getting wiser, taking care to be obedient to his parents, thinking about how they're seeing him through their eyes, from their experience, from their perspective. And Mary is keeping the memory of this event in her heart because it hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, she, was like, she was in that temple when Jesus was just an infant. And that old Simeon the prophet came up and said, Mary, a sword's going to pierce your heart because of this kid. And maybe she thought, well, that must have been the moment. And she remembered, she kept it in her heart. Mm -hmm. How could she know that the cross was coming mm -hmm. a hundred times worse or more, a yeah. thousand times worse? But she, she remembered the good things and she remembered the heartbreak because the heartbreak is, is just a part of the love, right? He increased in wisdom and in stature and in divine and human favor. You know, we've been talking for, gosh, I guess this is the seventh week I've been looking at Jesus' birth and uh, before his birth, getting ready for it, and then all the way up through him being 12 years old in his childhood. We've covered quite a number of wonderful stories, and we've got them recorded. They're on Facebook, they're on YouTube. They're there for you to go back and look at. The power of this story for me is Jesus' humanity. The power of this story for me is the graciousness and, and the intense care with which Mary and Joseph raised their little boy. They loved him. They scolded him. They taught him. They taught him to walk. They taught him to read. They taught him to love and to serve and to be respectful. They taught him the law and the scriptures. They, they taught him their culture and their ethnic identity. He, they, told, he, they, they taught him uh, who he was, and his nation, you know, who they are as an Israelite people and as a country. And taught him about the Romans, taught him about the scribes, the Pharisees, the priests, everything. They... They clearly did a good job. Little did they know that, she would leave, that he would leave her again. Joseph may have been dead when Jesus was about 30. Most sons stay home and take care of mom. Most sons, especially the oldest sons, take over the father's business. And in this case, that would have been whatever building business that Joseph had put together. But Jesus would leave again. Sometimes his heavenly father just had a higher calling for him. And that didn't always sit well with mom. But I don't think there was a moment that she wasn't proud of him. In the name of the father and the son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Welcome to you. Welcome, everybody. Um, I have my lapel mic on, so I'm trying to sit close enough to this thing where um, I have a very short cord. It's not much of a cord. I'm thinking about getting an extension. It might help. Um, I think the setup is working a little bit better today. We have less glare on the screen. I was unaware last week about that glare. Patricia semi-fixed it during the thing, but, you know, uh, you can't do everything. We're trying to do all the tech stuff at the same time that I'm preparing to do worship and and give a message, and Patricia keeping up with the prayer lists and on y'all's messages, so it's a lot to do, but it sure is fun, and it's great to be with you. Um, I just wanted to go right as right as we can make it go. So what are y'all up to? How are you out there in Atlanta land and beyond? I know we got people who watch from all around, actually around the world. We typically have someone or, or two or three who are listening in from Bethlehem over in Palestine, and we often have pastors, uh, friends of mine listening in from Tennessee. Um, I just saw Jean. Family. Hey, Jean, Jean is uh, what? Jean Martino is um, is up there. Ooh, the name of his town slipped my mind, but there you go. Tennessee. Yeah, it's in Tennessee. He's 
north of Nashville, something borough, I think. Um, Mur Mur not Murfreesboro, but something. Anyway, um, so Dale is up there too. He's usually here. Uh, we have all kinds of friends who are not members of Owl Rock and Natty Methodist Church who are either um, people who were formerly in churches that I served in Mississippi or people who just found us on Facebook and, and are showing up. Um, last week's sermon was, uh, last week's service was, uh, the video was watched over 300 times on Facebook. So um, we're reaching people and that's a wonderful thing. So please remember when this is over to hit your share button because the more you people, the more of you share, it's exponential almost. It's like you share and all your friends see it, but then if somebody else shares and all their friends see it, you can see how other people might be looking for a message um, that is uh, careful about preaching biblically, um, that doesn't make assumptions and just quote uh, errant traditions, um, sometimes beloved traditions that people don't want to have messed with, but uh, I'm just crazy enough to actually want to preach what the Bible says, and that's what I'm doing to the best of my ability. If you want people to hear messages like this, you know, the way to plug them in is just to share this week in and week out. Also, uh, Patricia, um, if you can get the number for people, uh, the, the church members or anyone else who wants to give, mm -hmm. you can do it uh, on, what's it called? Zilla? On Zell. Zell? Mm -hmm. On Zell. Um, and if you want to mail a check, if you, I'll rock folks, if you want to mail a check, it's 5880 Campbellton Road, Southwest Atlanta, 30331. I think you all know that. 5880 Campbellton Road, Southwest, Atlanta, 30331. That'll be on the recording for those of you who would, might want to check on it later. Come by and visit us once we get through with this COVID mess. And um, then the telephone number, I'm not sure yet. We'll get I that for you. 404 518 518 1881. 1881. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the number. And uh, so, announcements I, I really I really don't have any. Thank you. I guess I do. Thank you, Donna and Scott and Sean for going out in the rain and working on getting the decorations down for, from the holidays um, this week. Um, it was not a good week for them because Sean and fortunately not hurt badly, but Sean and Scott were in a wreck. So uh, they had a rental car and went to the church and took down ornaments. So I <laughs> bless their hearts, right? And and I'm, I think Sandra's been doing some stuff, but she didn't tell me what she did. Okay. But thanks, always thanks for our trustees chairperson Sandra and Junior. Um, I'm sure things are looking great down there. I haven't been down there uh, this weekend, but I'll, we'll be checking it out. I'm sure it's fine. Thank you, everybody. Patricia, any announcements uh, before we turn to the prayer list? Um, Would you like to join me? Sure. <clears throat> I'll just come on right in here close to me, yeah. No, don't be singing, Michael Jackson. <laughs> Why do birds suddenly appear? Hey, that's weird. <laughs> it rattles. Hmm. Okay. So, um, I'm looking for um, a wreath to be to replace the one that got. Caught a fire uh, the Patricia, other Patricia, you were, oh, where are you? Oh, oh, you were, that's when you were leaning forward. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so I'm looking for a wreath. Um, I looked at several online. Um, that what? The wreath that got burnt. It caught a fire the other oh, Sunday. Oh, oh, the Advent wreath. Yeah, the Advent wreath. So. Yeah, we killed the Advent wreath. It, it went up in a blaze of glory. <laughs> uh, we'll have to get another one. Yeah, so I'll... Um, we'll figure it out. Yep, yeah. we'll, we'll get a new one. Um, we have James um, Hall listening today. Hey, James, on the phone. He and Erica. Good to hear your voice, man. Glad to be here. Hey, awesome. <laughs> okay. So we have several people with us today. We got Joe Hooper. And Joe and Donna and Ruby and Jim. Hey, Jim. Um, show me the list. Right here. Uh, Jim, Joe. Mm -hmm. Lori, hey, Lori I hope the worm is with you. Um, Sherry, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Hope your family's doing okay. Um, Elaine, as always. Donna, good to see you. Ann May from Mississippi. Sheila. Uh, Paula, um, who sometimes has Sarah with her. Mm -hmm. And Ralph. And Jean Martino. Mm -hmm. I bet Becky listens in with him sometimes. I bet she does. And uh, we got James and Erica and Jonah and Ashley and uh, any. There are probably other people, mm -hmm. but um, who didn't type yeah, didn't in? Type we in. usually have twenty-five to forty people who are listening live. It's amazing. And then we have every week we have more than a hundred and usually closer to two hundred who watch the recording. Mm -hmm. So it's really nice to know that you know that we're making a difference mm -hmm. and we hope we are fingers crossed we're we're doing our best and also we're hoping that it doing things a little bit differently makes it this confinement that we're all experiencing a little bit less depressing mm -hmm. you know because you get to see us live we do kind of unusual stuff that we wouldn't normally do in the sanctuary we go out into the world and show you cool places when the weather's not terrible like it is today it was 20 something this morning mm. so um yeah, so, so it's 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 uh, it's a blessing to be able to do this. Um, it uh, lifts my spirits for sure every week, and we want to pray for folks. I know that Sheila's um, granddaughter Dakota needs our prayers, and Teresa Cox has been really, really struggling with her cancer issues as of recently. I don't know, Ruby. Do you have any updates on? Give on us an Teresa, update, please, uh, if you have one on uh, Teresa and um, Patricia's. Sister Debbie. Mm -hmm. She's in Miami right now um, seeing the doctor. They're trying to figure out what's going on with her, but she's not been well. And my other sister, Vern, is with her. Vern is a um, RN, a nurse. Um, so she's traveling with her, and they're hoping to get some answers, hopefully this week. She needs to have a biopsy. But um, she has some lesions on her bone and, and on her bones, and um, so we're just praying that she's okay. All right, we're praying for Debbie for sure, and Vern, who's with her, and we're praying for Amina's grandbaby. We're praying for our friend Jonah, and we're praying for my cousin um, Ashley and her husband Philip and their three little girls, beautiful little girls. Mm -hmm. And we're praying uh, for Scott and Sean and Donna. Uh, following Scott and Sean's wreck this week. I don't know how serious it was, but they were not seriously hurt from what I could tell uh, from talking to Donna. Yeah, what she said, she typed in... Um, Donna typed something. We're checking. Just myself and Sean did it. Oh, um, just yourself and Sean. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she said that we had some Advent wreaths at the church, I think, where the candles... Uh, okay. <laughs> that, well, we might, but I think we set the good one on fire. <laughs> Donna, we'll you go back out. and look on the video. You know, we, we should do a clip of videos and just make our own little YouTube bloopers. Mm -hmm. You know, because one time we were we were doing this and a picture fell off the wall. Mm -hmm. um, weird things happened when we've been out, and, and then we were we were on the bridge to nowhere. Yeah, I and remember. some guys came up and started talking to us, mm -hmm. and there just all kinds of interesting things have happened uh, when we've been doing these services. Uh, not the least of which was our TV nearly caught on fire back here. I know. So there's also a prayer request from Dita Joel. Uh, pray for her friend Kevin who has some ser serious um, health issues. Okay, this is Dita's friend Kevin. Mm-hmm. Okay, we got it. Dita, are we pronouncing your name right? Will you please give us some sort of a thumbs up or something? Is it is it Dita? Dita? Joel? Joel? Is it Dita or Data or I, I'm not sure. I'm, I don't know either. It's D E D A. Mm -hmm. Amy has joined us. Hey, Amy. Welcome, Amy. We should add Junie. Just keep praying for Junie. She's bless her heart. She's such. She's just such a sweetie. Yeah, definitely added to the list. Too. Yeah. And well, we could uh, we could add Nancy. Mm-hmm. Nancy's still in uh, hospice. Mm-hmm. Now, Jim, how are you doing? We keep you in prayer as well, Jim. Okay. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, are there any other requests before we go to to prayer? Yeah, Dita says Dita yes. Sa- yeah, Dita says yes. It's, it's pronounced Dita. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, any others? Can you scroll down, Patricia, see if we missed anything? Look at the bottom, my friend. That's Dita. Okay. Serious health issues. Okay. We got it. We got it, Dita. Anything else, Patricia? Uh, not right now. If there's anything else. Uh, okay. Oh, Ruby is saying to pray for Doris Christensen and her husband. They both have great issues going on. Hey, Arlene. Arlene, uh, saying hi to everyone. Doris Christensen and husband. Husband, yes. And this is a friend of. So this is someone, uh, request, this request comes from whom? Ruby. Ruby, got it. Mm-hmm. All right. You ready? She's still checking. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's pray together. Lord, we're, we're so thankful for everybody who's here with us, for, uh, for James and Erica and for Jim, Joe, Lori, Sherry, the whole bunch of you out there, Donna, everybody. Yes, Lord. We just pray for all of you who are listening right now live. We pray for those who listen to the recording as well. Um, we have special prayers for, um, for Sheila's granddaughter, Dakota. For um, Ruby's friends, Doris Christensen and her, her husband, we pray for um, Teresa Cox, who is really struggling right now. Uh, for Patricia's sister Debbie and her doctor's visit in Miami. For Amina's grandbaby. For Jonah. For Ashley and her family. For Scott and Sean and Donna. Yes, Lord. For um, for Dita's friend Kevin, with some very serious health issues. For Nancy, and for Junie, and for all that we name in our hearts right now. Yes, Lord. Lord, we're so grateful to be able to be together in this way. We'd rather be together in per- person. Uh, we're reminded of the Apostle Paul who struggled when he wrote letters to the churches saying, I wish I were there. But letters were the next best thing, and so is Facebook, and we're so glad to live stream and be with everybody each week. We ask, Lord, that you bless each person with, uh, with your grace, yes, Lord. with your strength, yes. with your faith. Yes, Lord. You know, Lord, we're aware you have more faith in us than we have in ourselves sometimes, and we could use a little bit of that. Show us your faith in us through Christ Jesus. Yes, Lord. Let Him build up our faith. Let Him strengthen our ability to sustain, to be, to, to, to be more stick to to have more resiliency, to have the ability to snap back to, yes, and, and to endure. Lord, we thank You for that strength of the Holy Spirit to do those things in, in difficult times. Yes, and we all need healing in one way or another, Lord. We, we ask that You would heal each and every one of us whether it's something that's bothering us, financial, emotional, whatever it is, Lord, in our minds or our bodies or our spirits, heal us, make us more whole, make us closer to You, fill us, reveal Yourself to us in new and different and unexpected ways. We thank You for Patricia. We thank You for our church and its leaders. We're so grateful that you were with us by the power of your mighty spirit this morning. And we are going to pray this prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. Amen. Well, amen, amen, amen to James here on the telephone, to all of you out and there Erica. and live and Erica. Is Erica's here too? Yes. Uh, and live stream land hey. out there on Facebook. Hey, Erica. Uh, we got your speaker on now. You want to say anything to anybody? I'm, you can talk now. Hi, everybody. I miss you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and you recognize Erica if you know her, right? <laughs> James, you want to say hey? I, I miss you all too. I, I look forward to maybe someday we can all start getting back together again. Well, amen, James. We we want the same thing, man. We want the same thing. So even when we do, James, when we do get back together at the church, we're not going to stop doing this. We're reaching too many people, and and, it, and it's meaning too much right. to them and to me too. So we're going to keep doing this, but mm -hmm. we'll do both. We're going to do both one yeah. day, soon and very soon. We're going to do both. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you, James. Um, thank you. I enjoyed the sermon. I look forward to next Sunday. I appreciate it, James. I'm going to give the benediction to James and everybody else and Erica. Donna said that she missed you, Erica and James. Yeah, Donna's <laughs> saying on, on the, she typed in that she's missing you guys. Mm -hmm. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Ninefold, amen. Amen, amen. You want to go around there and press that button? Amen. Can and you do it, please? Everybody. Bye, everybody. You, can you, you can find the button. That's cool. But if yeah. you can't, I'll come and do it for you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks okay. to Patricia for helping. Can, can you press that button over there, please? Yes. Patricia. Yes. Can you put, I wasn't thinking about it at the time. I'm sorry. I'm, you're unable to do it? Yeah. Okay. Easier said than done, right? Yeah.